Hello, welcome to the fourth installment in my project to make my own DCC decoders from scratch for my N-gauge trains, to hopefully save money, but mostly for the fun of the challenge. Last time around I reduced the size of what I'd experimented with to get most of the components to fit into a Dapol Super Voyager driving car, with all power and signals coming via the Voyager's DCC socket and the decoder directly powering some external LEDs in response to DCC speed and direction commands. The next step was to control the Voyager's lights, which I hadn't yet experimented with. By inspecting the Voyager's internal circuit board I'd found its lights are all directly connected to positive track power from the wheel pickups, and the negative connections from the white and red lights come back to DCC socket pins 5 and 6 respectively. This means the decoder can't directly power the lights, it has to connect pins 5 and 6 to the low track power to turn lights on, and for this a transistor sounded like the right component. I didn't really know where to start with what to look for, so I just bought an assorted pack of surface mount transistors, on the assumption there'd be some fairly general purpose ones in there. Between some codes on the packet label and markings on the transistors, I found some datasheets that seem to match, though they might not be for exactly the right variants or manufacturers. They'll have to do, because what I bought didn't come with any other documentation. The 18 different types of transistors in the pack were all bipolar junction, with a mix of NPN and PNP types. Having read a few tutorials online, I concluded I needed the NPN ones to use as switches. The base of the transistor would connect to a digital output from the decoder's AT Tiny 85, the emitter to ground, and the collector to pin 5 or 6 of the decoder. To connect the collector and emitter, that is, to complete the circuit for the LEDs back to track power to switch them on, the AT Tiny would set its output to the transistor base to 5 volts and to switch the LEDs off it would set it to 0 volts. DCC track power is typically a higher voltage than peak DC track power, and there's a warning in the Super Voyager's manual about connecting the lights directly to DCC track power, so the decoder needs to add some extra resistance into the LED circuit. I put a blanking plate back into one of the Voyager driving cars, then connected the model to my old DC controller via some track. Conveniently, there are protruding connections to the three pins in the little socket that connects the internal circuit board to the lights, so I could use those to measure the voltage drop of the white and red lights. The red lights dropped 1.57 or 1.58 volts, and the white ones 2.48. I also measured the range of currents and track voltages at which the lights looked bright enough, so I'd know what kind of current to aim for when controlling them on DCC. I was quite surprised at how little current they need, the peak was around 8 milliamps when my controller's output maxed at around 10 volts, and they still visibly illuminated with as little as 1 milliamp. For good brightness, the red needed a minimum of around 3 or 4 milliamps, and the white around 4 or 5. Since normal peak DC voltage is 12 volts rather than 10, the lights will be able to safely tolerate a bit more than 8 milliamps, so 8 is okay as a target maximum, giving me a range of 5 to 8 milliamps to aim for. Next, it was time to work out exactly what to do with the transistors, which took a lot of internet searching and article reading. The overall principles for bipolar junction transistors seem easy enough to understand. The transistor has four modes of working – cut-off, active, saturation, and reverse active. I pretty much ignored reverse active – it sounds like they're not really supposed to be used in that mode. Cut-off means it acts like a switch that's off, so that's what I need it to be in when I want the train's lights to be off. Active means it's acting as a signal amplifier. I don't want that. Saturation means it's acting like a switch that's on, so that's what I need when I want the train's lights to be on. So far, so good. What I found difficult was relating what I read in articles to what values were available in the datasheets. When transistors are working in their amplifier mode, you need to know how much amplification they're going to be doing. The datasheets give a range of values for this in the HFE, or DC current gain sections, based on how much current is coming through the collector before it's amplified. When a transistor is saturated it doesn't do any amplification, so how do you work out how much current needs to go into the base to put it into saturation? When trying to find the answer to that I frequently came across the seemingly magical ratio of 10 in articles and discussions. That is, the base current needs to be 10 times smaller than the current you want going through the collector. Others said to use the smallest value for DC current gain listed in the datasheet. Others said 20 was a better rule of thumb. I don't like relying on rules of thumb, I'd much rather understand something, or at the very least just know for certain how to use datasheets to arrive at the answer. 
The characteristics of transistors vary a lot, even with the same design type and vary by ambient temperature, so there are quite a few parameters to understand. There is no graph in my datasheets that shows the saturation current needed for any particular collector current. However, there are two graphs here that talk about saturation, and although they're plotting collector current against voltages rather than base current, both list a beta value of 10. Beta is the symbol used to represent DC current gain, so the manufacturers here are using the magic 10 ratio between collector and base current to put the transistor into saturation. Two of the points from these two graphs are listed in the characteristics table, which directly show the base current being a tenth of the collector current. So regardless of my understanding, it seems safe to use 10 as the saturation ratio. Looking at the numbers, this ratio of 10 means the base current is a lot higher relative to the collector current than for any other DC current gain values listed in the datasheet. The lowest HFE value here is 30, where the base current would need to be 1 30th of the collector. I gather that if I were to use this as the ratio for saturation, or a ratio just below it like 29, it would only just be enough base current relative to the collector current to put the transistor into saturation. Fluctuations in temperature, or having characteristics not exactly like the example in the datasheet, could cause it to fall out of saturation mode, so the much lower ratio of 10 is presumably to make sure it's firmly and reliably into saturation. However, too far above will cause the transistor to get hot, so I won't be aiming to have a base current any higher than one tenth of the collectors. Content that I'd got enough of a grasp on what to do, it was time for a practical experiment. Having found the correct transistor, one labelled 3904 and with a marking 1AM on it, I soldered that to some spare perf board along with screw terminals for easy connections. My test has a 5 volt power supply and an LED connected via a 220 ohm resistor. I measured the current through that as 13 milliamps, so that's the target current through the transistor's collector. The base current needs to be a tenth of that, so 1.3 milliamps. There's a voltage drop across the base to emitter. There's a chart in the datasheet to show what that should be, which looks like being a bit more than 7.5 volts. I didn't actually look this up at the time, I used a value of 7 from vague memory. With a 5 volt supply and a 0.7 volt drop resulting in 4.3 volts across the base resistor, that means a 3308 ohm resistor to produce the target base current of 0.0013 amps. That's very close to a standard resistor value of 3.3 kilo ohms which is convenient, so I used one of those. There's also a small voltage drop across the collector and emitter. The maximum values in the characteristics table for this are off the chart for typical characteristics. According to the chart, it'll be about 50 millivolts for 13 milliamps, so I reasoned that wouldn't make enough of a difference to the current to need to worry about it for this experiment. The experiment was a success. To start with, I was trying to switch the transistor off just by unplugging the cable to its base but that left it floating rather than pulled down to zero volts. After adding a 2.2k resistor to ground for it, I was able to switch the transistor fully off by connecting its base to that, and fully on by connecting the base through the 3.3k resistor on the positive power line. At one point I accidentally touched the base wire to the wrong side of a resistor, so without resistance it would have got a much higher current, and since then the transistor always behaves as if fully on, so I think I broke it. Now feeling I knew how to make the transistor work as a switch, I planned what I'd need to put together for the Super Voyager. At this point I re-measured the Voyager's current against voltage more precisely, this time measuring both at the same time. Since I knew the voltage drops across the lights, I could work out roughly what resistance values are on the PCB. The calculations came out close to standard resistor values of 1000 for the red and 750 for the white. Using those, I could calculate what would happen to current at various voltages and with various values of extra resistors, particularly standard values, and concluded that with 1k resistors the lights would be bright enough at the normal 13 volts of my DCC system, would still be bright enough if it dropped as low as 8 volts, and would be safe with as much as 18. I found another small bit of perf board and soldered the transistors and resistors to that. This is still just a prototype, so I didn't make the board as small as it could be. I thought I'd already calculated the right resistor values for transistor base currents, so followed the notes I'd written, but they were actually for my experiment with a different LED. I didn't realise until after soldering everything together, so decided to just see what would happen. Those calculations were for a current of 13 milliamps through the LEDs, so twice as much as will go through the LEDs in the Voyager. 
That meant the transistor base current would be double what it should be, which meant it would emphatically enter saturation, but should still have been around 75 times lower than the maximum peak base current rating, according to the datasheet. I then connected the transistor board to the main decoder board, but didn't change any of the code on the ATtiny85. It was programmed to send the output pins high or low to turn LEDs on or off, which would now turn the transistors on or off instead. Once the decoder was plugged in and an appropriate DCC command issued, the Voyager's white lights came on, but stayed on when I changed the direction of the train, so something wasn't right. Over several days I tried quite a few different things and got some seemingly random outcomes, but have come to some firm conclusions. The red lights in this Voyager driving car don't work anymore. This is a different driving car to the one I was measuring the voltages and currents on earlier, but I didn't realise for quite a while that these were broken, and instead assumed it was something wrong with my decoder. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to brave taking the cab apart in the Voyager to see if I can fix or replace that. The ATtiny is correctly programmed and responds to DCC change of direction commands for address 221, most of the time. It had a day where it would switch the lights on after receiving the first speed and direction command, but after that wouldn't switch them off. Once I'd soldered some LEDs and resistors onto a board to help see what was going on, it started working properly again, without any change of code. This isn't the first time the ATtiny seems to have had an off day. I think there's something about my setup that can go wrong but I've no idea what at this stage. I intend to rework its code at some point to hopefully make it more efficient and reliable. My approach to the transistors does work. I did eventually have the white lights responding correctly via a secondary board with a transistor on it, this time with a 6.8k resistor to limit base current to the correct ratio. So a lot of my time getting to this point has been spent reading about transistors and in puzzling over what wasn't working. By comparison, actually soldering things together has been pretty quick. The next step I want to take with this is to make another perf board based decoder that fits into the Voyager and which has all of the necessary components to decode the DCC commands and control the built in lights. In theory, it's not much of a step beyond where I've already got to, but would be a very satisfying milestone to reach. That's all for now. Bye bye!